Tchaikovsky was a composer of female characters. He was an extraordinarily sensitive person, and the conflicts, fears and dreams of his heroines touched him deeply and inspired him to write his greatest masterpieces. Their names were, for example, Tatiana, Aurora or Juliet. Like Wagner, a few years earlier, Tchaikovsky was saved in his most existential life crisis by an understanding patron. And within a very short time, he transformed himself from a suicidal candidate to a celebrated, successful composer. But fears of loss from childhood, outlawed homosexuality, weak health and artistic crisis accompanied him throughout his life. They made him a driven man, but spurred him on to artistic excellence. Who was Peter Tchaikovsky? What people and places shaped him? A biographical approach to the artist of the century from Russia. His father Ilya was an engineer and thanks to his efficiency, he became a wealthy factory manager for a time. His wife, Alexandra, 17 years younger, was the pure opposite. She was sensitive and musical. Peter had a very good relationship with both of them, but his relationship with his mother was the most sacred to him. Piotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky was born on April 25th, 1840, in the village of Watkinsk. He was born on a manor in the Urals, where his father was a factory manager. Peter had five siblings, of whom he had the closest relationship with Modest, ten years younger, during his life. At the age of five, another important female reference person appeared in his life. It was a nanny from the Alsace region of France who lovingly cared for and taught the children. She was employed by the Tchaikovskys for almost five years and we owe many insights into Peter's character to Fanny Durbach's records. She described him as a hypersensitive child who could be thrown off course by the slightest reprimand. In addition to his love of music, his love of literature stood out and she affectionately called him my little Pushkin. Tchaikovsky kept in touch with her by letter throughout his life and visited her at home in Alsace a year before his death. Peter showed great musical talent from his youngest years and by the age of five he could play songs after hearing them for the first time and soon he was playing better than his piano teacher. He especially enjoyed an orchestrion that could play popular opera melodies. Tchaikovsky himself reported that the instrument was the reason for his lifelong love of Mozart's music. When the parents moved to St. Petersburg, they decided to send the 10-year-old to boarding school. They sent him to a preparatory school for a prestigious institute that taught administrative law to future administrators. Peter was not ready and later described the experience as traumatic, as he desperately tried to cling to his mother. He found distraction in visiting the great musical institution of St. Petersburg, where he heard pieces with orchestra for the first time and came into contact with Klinka's music. A visit to the ballet Giselle also made a great impression on him. His frequent companion was Modest Vakar, a family friend. But shortly after, a second catastrophe befell him, when, during a visit to Vakar, he infected Vakar's five-year-old son with cholera. When the child died shortly thereafter, Peter was shaken and blamed himself for the death of the five-year-old. Tchaikovsky's education at the boys' boarding school focused on law, but literature and music were also taught. When Peter was 13 years old, the future poet Alexei Apukhtin came to the same class and became his best friend. Early on, Peter realized his homosexuality and found a kindred spirit in Alexei. The two also shared a love of literature. But the next catastrophe soon befell Peter. 
His mother Alexandra died of cholera in 1854 and his father was also infected but narrowly escaped death. Now Peter lost the most important caregiver of his life and Tchaikovsky lamented his fate throughout his life. His father hired the German pianist Rudolf Koeninger to teach his son. When Tchaikovsky's training as an administrative official was coming to an end, his father wanted to know whether his son had a musical talent to study music. Koeninger would later bitterly regret his judgment, telling his father, There is no musical talent. He is not suitable for a musical career, and it is too late to start. On the advice of his father, Tchaikovsky now decided to take a two-pronged approach and pursue the study of music while earning a living as a civil servant. The most important reference person at the conservatory was Anton Rubinstein, who was 10 years older and not yet famous. In view of Tchaikovsky's evident talent, Rubinstein urged him to study full-time, which Tchaikovsky did after two years. Despite the talent, no important work was written during this conservatory period. On the contrary, his final work assigned to him became a great disappointment for his teachers. The Schiller's Ode to Freedom to be set to music failed to touch the emotions of the sensitive Tchaikovsky. Instead of composing for a female soul in an extreme state, he had to compose for an abstract ideal which he did not succeed in. He himself was aware of this and avoided attending the final concert to avoid disgrace. The St. Petersburg Conservatory was largely run by the Rubinstein brothers. On the advice of Anton, Nikolai Rubinstein offered the 26-year-old Tchaikovsky a professorship. The latter accepted and Nikolai Rubinstein became one of his closest artistic companions. The penniless Tchaikovsky was even allowed to live with Rubinstein, the conservatory director, for a longer period of time. These ten years became years in which Tchaikovsky searched for his position as an artist and as a person. In his artistic search, he came into contact with the mighty five. He tried many things and discarded many things, such as three operas, which he considered failed attempts. Balakirev, in particular, was his mentor. Giving him advice and support, he encouraged him to write the fantasy overture Romeo and Juliet. In the process, he was not afraid to draw Tchaikovsky out with scathing criticism. He found fault with almost everything, but also saw that the love motif, Tchaikovsky's first great and true love melody, was the great thought to which the character of Juliet had inspired him. Tchaikovsky felt his homosexuality in his middle years as an element that separated him from society. He suffered greatly from it, but was able to live it out, partly in secret. In his correspondence with his brother Modest, who was also homosexual, Tchaikovsky wrote openly about his lifestyle. At the age of 28, Something surprising happened to him. He fell in love with a woman for the only and last time. It was a famous French singer named Désiré Artaud. He was even ready for marriage, but his environment prevented the liaison and Désiré married someone else two months later. As a witness of the relationship exist five romances that he had written for the singer. He wrote over 100 romances in his career, which were his personal learning laboratory for the larger forms. He always tried to filter out the dominant psychological motif in the lyrical text first and to find the corresponding musical expression, which became the basis for the composition. The busy Tchaikovsky was also active as a journalist during these years. He met the European musical light on his travels and attended the first Bayreuth festival in 1876. He expressed himself unflatteringly about Wagner's work. 
According to his own statement, his most beautiful experience of these years was Bizet's Carmen, whose premiere he witnessed. In the mid-70s, Tchaikovsky transformed himself from an ugly duckling into a swan. Two immortal strokes of genius now literally burst out of him. The first stroke was his first piano concerto. It is true that his mentor Anton Rubinstein had only shouted contempt for the work at him when he reviewed it, but Tchaikovsky had matured and offered it to Hans von Bülow, who premiered it with great success in Boston in 1875. Rubinstein revised his opinion of the concerto and initiated its triumphal march in Europe. The second stroke of genius out of the blue was the ballad Swan Lake. Some fellow musicians had advised Tchaikovsky against composing ballad music. Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov felt that this was an undertaking unworthy of Tchaikovsky's talent. But Tchaikovsky had a penchant for dance music, and for him it meant the possibility of writing music away from the rigid formalism of the symphony and concertos, and immersing himself in dream worlds. The melancholy swan theme, which later acquired iconic significance for the genre of ballet, became a symbol of this. He wrote it for the Bolshoi Theatre of Moscow. Its resources were no match for the St. Petersburg Theatre and, inconceivably to us, the work attracted little attention and, inconceivably to us, the work attracted little attention and Swan Lake did not become a successful ballet until Petit Pass 1895 St. Petersburg production. In 1877, Tchaikovsky wrote his Onegin, the climax of which is the letter scene where a young, inexperienced woman writes a love letter to the worldly Onegin and is shamefully rejected by the arrogant bon vivant. Tchaikovsky suffered with her. What followed is well known. A former student, Antonina Ivavovna, wrote to him several times, confessed her love and asked for a meeting. Antonina became Tatiana for Tchaikovsky and the sensitive composer could not avoid a meeting, although he was in the middle of a romantic relationship with his former student Kotek. Now Tchaikovsky saw in Antonina the chance to pretend a bourgeois existence to the outside world in order to silence the troublesome gardens of morals. Antonina accepted this arrangement and the two arranged a wedding in great haste and secrecy in the summer of 1877. The witness to the marriage were Tchaikovsky's brother Anatoly and Josef Kotek. The wedding threw him off track. The relationship with a woman created him such a physical aversion that after a few days he left her in flight forever. This was followed by a nervous breakdown and Tchaikovsky even went into the Moskwa River in winter to catch pneumonia in the ice-cold water. In this dramatic situation he received a letter from a rich, widowed woman with an appreciation of art. Her name was Alesta von Meck, and she had heard about Tchaikovsky from Josip Kotek, who was acting as her daughter's violin teacher during the summer. She was now to become his patron and pen pal for the next 14 years. In fact, during the entire period of correspondence, there were only sporadic and fleeting meetings from a distance, during which not a word was exchanged. These meetings exerted a strange attraction on the two, and they enjoyed feeling the closeness of their prospective pen pals from time to time. But the meeting never occurred. The sudden material security caused Tchaikovsky's creative energy to explode. Within a few months, he wrote three immortal works. In the spring, he finished Eugene Unigin and his fourth symphony. In the spring he spent happy month on Lake Geneva with his friend and violinist Josef Kotek, writing his great violin concerto. The following years Tchaikovsky traveled a lot. He was in Italy especially often. He became an international celebrity 
and he conducted widely acclaimed concerts even in the United States. In the mid-80s, he felt the need to settle down again. The music world today is glad he did, because what happened from 1888 on is breathtaking. In his last five years, he gave posterity an immortal masterpiece every year. Inspired by his collaboration with the great ballad choreographer Marius Petipa, Tchaikovsky wrote the two ballads Sleeping Beauty and Nutcracker for the Marinsky Theatre in St. Petersburg. Again, it was the female characters who inspired him to write the immortal melodies. Tchaikovsky now deliberately sought rural seclusion and he moved to Klin, a small rural town north of Moscow. Daily walks in nature around the nearby Sestra River stimulated his creativity. In his last years, his brother Modest and nephew Vladimir Davidov were his closest companions. Vladimir, called Bob, was also homosexual and became the main heir and recipient of the dedication to Tchaikovsky's last symphony. In the time surrounding the work on Queen of Spades, there was a rift between Tchaikovsky and the Baroness von Meck, without warning. The patroness stopped the correspondence and stopped all payments. She never gave the reason for this. After her death, there were various speculations that there was a connection with the role of the countess in the opera Queen of Spades. For in this great work, Tchaikovsky paints an unflattering picture of an elderly lady with the figure of the countess. Did the baroness possibly feel betrayed and ridiculed? The Pathetic became his last work, premiered only nine days before his death. The slow last movement of the only 53-year-old was reminiscent of a requiem and quotes a motive from a Russian requiem mass. Did he anticipate his death? Five days before his death, Tchaikovsky drank the ominous glass of water in Liner's restaurant although he was informed by the waiter that boiled water was not available, which was necessary because of the rampant cholera. He then went to Modest's apartment and was never to leave it, dying on November 6, 1893. Many books have been written about the mystery of Tchaikovsky's cause of death. Was it the glass of water with which he had involuntarily contracted cholera, which was rampant in St. Petersburg? Or was it a court of honor whose verdict he had bowed to and swallowed arsenic? Nowadays, the opinion prevails that the form is true. The building where he died still exists. His death room can even be booked as Tchaikovsky Suite in a hotel called Tchaikovsky House. It was the apartment of his brother Modest at that time. In the photo you can see the death room framed in blue. Tchaikovsky's abdication took place in St. Petersburg in the magnificent Kazan Cathedral. The sympathy was huge. 60,000 people applied for tickets and the Tsar personally paid the funeral expenses. His grave is in the Tikvin Cemetery near the Alexander Nevsky Monastery. Alexander Borodin, Mikhail Glinka, Rimsky Korsakov and Modest Mussorgsky also rest near him. So, the five great Russian composers of the 19th century have found a common, dignified resting place in St. Petersburg.